All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, tonight we are still going to be talking about the skandhas. Uh, so we're still going to be in the Samyutta Nikaya. We are still going to be in section 22, which is the section on the skandhas. So tonight, tonight's one of those nights where we're going to start with a, a little sutra, and then we're going to get to the main event. We're going to get to the main sutra. So, and the reason why that is, is so this whole idea of the five aggregates that we've been talking about, there's a lot of, a lot of angles, a lot of ideas that are wrapped up in this. And so the sutras that I've chosen over the last several weeks, they've been looking at sort of different aspects of the teaching of the five skandhas. And there's one missing piece that I wanted to share with you. And then we're going to get to the big sutra tonight that is actually going to include a bunch of the pieces that we've already talked about. So we're going to start with this tiny sutra. So if you have the, the Samyutta Nikaya, I'm on page 877. Uh, no, I didn't send you the link to this one. This is a last minute um, edition. But there is an entire section. It's short. I think there's only a handful of sutras. But I'm going to be reading sutra number 33 which is called Not Yours, uh, Na Tumhaka, Na Tumhaka, Not Yours. So again, I'm on page 877. This is Sutra 33. And yeah, let's just go ahead. And this is just our little, just to get us going. And it's to illustrate one particular idea. So as usual, we're at Shravasti or Sabati where the Buddha said this, bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. And what is it, bhikkhus, that is not yours? Form is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Sensations are not yours. Abandon them. <laughs> when you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Perception is not yours. Abandon it. <laughs> when you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Conditioning or habits are not yours. <laughs> Abandon them. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Suppose, bhikkhus, People were carrying off the grass and sticks and branches and foliage in this Jetta's grove, or to burn them, or to do with them what they wish. Would you think people are carrying us off, or they're burning us, or doing with us as they wish? Would you think that way, Bikus? No, venerable sir. For what reason? Because, venerable sir, all of that stuff, the sticks and the grass, that's not ours. Or that is neither ourself nor what belongs to ourself. So too, bhikkhus, form is not yours. Sensation, perception, conditioning, consciousness, they're not yours. 
abandon them. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Bing. <laughs> okay, so that was sort of just, it's a little tiny little sutra, but I wanted to work with it for a moment because it's, we haven't quite looked at that angle in that way. We've heard about sort of the, the problems of clinging to the skandhas. We've heard about sort of the value or the, the benefit of not clinging to the skandhas, but we hadn't quite heard that language. The language that form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the five aggregates, they're not you, they're not yours. So abandon them. And if you want a kind of something to think about, you can think about that analogy that the Buddha gives, which is look over, look over there. Look at all that stuff over there. If somebody were to come and grab that stuff and run away with it, would you think they were running away with you? Well, no, because that stuff isn't me. So let them run away with it. Well, the Buddha is saying that the body of form and sensations and perception and conditioning and consciousness, they're like that. They're like that stuff over there that isn't you, that isn't yours. But we are attached to it in that way. But this little sutra, the Buddha is saying, abandon it. And if you've abandoned, when you abandon it in that way, it'll lead to your welfare and happiness. So I wanted to introduce that idea of what is called not yours. It's going to factor into the longer sutra we're going to read tonight. But I just kind of, in a way, wanted to establish that idea first. Now, philosophically, if you're, if you're a, a thinker out there, philosophically, of course, this kind of raises a question. What is it that is abandoning form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness? <laughs> That's the million dollar question, right? Well, I do tonight, I do intend to try to get us there to answering that question, because I, I, I realize that it's sort of a, it's a glaring question in all of this. There's a way in which we might be able to understand it to a certain degree in terms of what it means to not grasp or cling to body of form, sensation, perception, condition, and consciousness. But then again, what is that? that is doing that then in that way. So that's sort of the, the overarching philosophical question tonight, but otherwise we're just gonna go much deeper into the skandhas. Any question though about that quick little sutra? Yeah, Maria, please. Um, just real quick. Um... Not sure how one abandons consciousness. So maybe you can address that. Yeah, let's save that for when we get into the longer sutra, because there's going to be a couple passages in there that I think will illustrate it. So rather than me, let's kind of listen to the Buddha. Cool. Um, one one little thing really quickly, just really, really quickly, actually. <clears throat> You'll notice if you if you have the whole Samyutta Nikaya, you'll notice that Sutra number 34, so I just read Sutra 33, Sutra 34, it's the exact same Sutra, except it doesn't have the whole analogy about the wood, about the grass and the sticks being carried off. And I think it's actually interesting to pause for a moment and kind of wonder. Like, why include both those versions then? And I think one of the reasons is, is that there's a way in which that 
analogy of the grass being burned up. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a little like heavy. And so I think that this is a really like skillful way of saying you can teach this sutra without mentioning that analogy about burning up all the grass. So that's just my theory about why they would include both versions. Just while we were here, I thought I'd mention it. So, but let's get to the, the main sutra tonight. So the main sutra is still in the Samyutta Nikaya. We're moving into actually a slightly different section of the Skandha section, but we're going to be on page 914 of the big book, and I'm reading sutra number 79. So this sutra is called the Kahajjaniya Sutta. And I was trying to dig into this word Kahajjaniya. It, it's tricky, and there's a, a way in which I don't even want to give it away just yet, like what exactly that word means. But yeah, so if you know already, you know already. Otherwise, let's hold off on what exactly Kahajjaniya means. When we get to that part of the sutra, uh, I'm going to make a big deal about it. But otherwise, I want to let's dive into this because actually there's so many different things to talk about. So once again, we're still at Shravasti or Savati. And the Buddha said this. Because those ascetics and Brahmins who recollect their manifold past lives or their manifold past abodes, they all recollect the five aggregates subject to clinging or a certain one of them. What five? When recollecting thus, bhikkhus, I had such and such form in the past. It is just form that one recollects. When recollecting, I had such and such sensations or I had such and such feelings in the past. It is just feeling, it is just sensation that one remembers or recollects. When recollecting, I had such a perception in the past. It is just perception that one recollects. When recollecting I had such conditioning or habits, volitional formations in the past, it is just samskara, it is just conditioning that one recollects. When recollecting I had such and such consciousness in the past, it's just consciousness that one recollects. So, Let's pause there. The, the next section is very interesting. So the Buddha is interestingly, he's talking about these other yogis, ascetics, Brahmins, meditators. And as you may know, it is a part of the Indian yoga meditation tradition that if you do enough meditation, one of the byproducts or side effects of doing meditation is memories. Uh, uh, sorry, Rina, we're on page 914. So one aspect of doing enough meditation is this remembering past lives. We don't need to get too into the details of that, but that's part of the tradition. It's even part of the Buddhist tradition to sort of you, would, you will have memories from these past lives in that way. But what the Buddha is saying, and I want to try to just clarify this quickly. What the Buddha is saying is, is that when those ascetics and Brahmins, when they were, when they're recollecting and they're like, oh, I was so-and-so back then. The Buddha is basically saying, when they say I had such and such a form, meaning, you know, I looked such and such a way, the Buddha saying they didn't look such and such a way. There was that body of form. And so now when I'm remembering 
a past life of mine when I looked a certain way, all I'm remembering is that body of form that looked that way. The Buddha is saying, though, that they are not recalling themselves from then, which is very similar to if you look at a picture of yourself from when you when you were young. And you're like, oh, I remember, I remember when I had that body. In that moment, when you're remembering that, <laughs> you are remembering that body of form, but the idea that it was me, that it was me then, that's the confusion in that sense. So the Buddha is saying when they think, they're remembering their past lives. They're really just remembering past bodies of form, past sensations, past conditioning, past consciousness in that way. Everybody feeling okay about that idea, right? Okay. And now this next section, we're going to go through each of the skandhas and the Buddha is about to give a reason why each of the skandhas is called what it is called. And I got to tell you that in, in researching this section, it's we're going to we're losing a lot because apparently the Buddha is playing a lot of interesting linguistic games where he's playing with language a lot. And I'm going to try, at least from my limited understanding of these languages, I'm going to try to illustrate or talk about a few of them but so the buddha says and why bhikkhus why do you call it rupa and why bhikkhus do you call it form why do you call it rupa it is deformed bhikkhus therefore it is called form now, if you have this edition, they have a great footnote there, and it has to do with the fact that the word deformed apparently is pronounced rupati. And so it has a similar sound. It's a homophone. It is not etymologically related to rupa, this word rupati. It's a, it's a homophone. So the Buddha is playing with language. But so he's saying, why do we call it form? because it's deformed <laughs> and it's kind of like funny in a way deformed by what he says deformed by cold deformed by heat deformed by hunger deformed by thirst deformed by contact with flies mosquitoes wind sun and serpents it is deformed bhikkhus Therefore, it's called form. So each of these is kind of a very subtle way of thinking about the each of the aggregates. In, in kind of looking at this over the last week, I got to tell you that I think it's advisable to, to read these as uh, somewhat metaphorical. So what I mean by that is, is that when it says like defo deformed by what? <clears throat> deformed, for example, deformed by thirst. Well, we know what thirst is in Buddhism, right? Tanha is another way of talking about craving, desire. To be hungry is another form of desire in that way. So yes, the body of form is sort of affected by heat and cold and mosquitoes and flies and hunger and thirst. It's affected by all those things. But I think the Buddha is playing this game of saying that it's like the body of form is deformed by the craving and the hunger and all of these things. So I think he's kind of operating on two levels, a literal level and a metaphorical level. That's my read of that. Everybody okay with form? Yeah, I have no. 
So by deformed, do you mean that we we have a misperception of it? No, that it's like, that it's all jacked up. <laughs> it's all messed up. Our, the, our body of form is all de deformed. It's all jacked up from craving too much. So it would be so, a, a way of... Because we're craving it or we're clinging to it we're we're deforming it it's just that, to be a little more accurate i would just say craving is deforming it is deforming it okay yeah there doesn't need to be an agent right right thank that. you yeah. yeah thank you okay so the, the the subtlety of this or exactly what's being spoken about i think will be a little clearer in the next one there's not exactly a play of words going on, but there is a play of ideas. And why, because do you call it Vedana? And why, because do you call it feeling or sensation? It feels, because, therefore it's called feeling. <clears throat> and what does it feel? It feels pleasure. It feels pain. It feels neither pleasure nor pain. It feels bhikkhus, therefore it's called feeling. Or it senses bhikkhus, therefore it's called sensation. Now, this one is, it's, it's, it's one of those ones that's like really simple, but then really kind of heavy. So from my understanding of the language, and this is all based on Bhikkhu Bodhi's amazing footnotes, what's being said here is that it's not you that senses and feels things. Sensation senses things. <laughs> so that's, sim that's putting it simply, which is this difference between the idea of I'm feeling versus there is feeling happening. And that's what the Buddha is getting at, or it seems based on Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnotes, that the Buddha is pointing at how sensation or Vedana, it senses. That's, that's why it's called sensation, because that's what it does, is sense. And again, where the confusion is, is the idea that I'm sensing. Everybody okay with that idea? Wonderful. And why, Bhikkhus, do you call it perception? Samya? It perceives, Bhikkhus. Therefore, it's called perception. And what does it perceive? It perceives blue. It perceives yellow. It perceives red. It perceives white. It perceives, Bhikkhus. Therefore, it's called perception. So, once again, the Buddha is using a very simple example of just these four colors. But, of course, he's talking about much more than that in terms of perception. And, you know, I think you could, you could make a lot of theories or a lot of conjecture about why those. What I find interesting about it I don't know why those four, but what I find interesting about those is in terms of perception, I myself as a Dharma teacher, I'm, I'm always using color as a great example of the way in which perception is entirely like on an individual basis, you know, because of like color blindness. So what what I see, and I, I know I need to be careful with my language, but what I see, like if I see the color red or whatever, somebody else might be seeing the color green. And that is truly a great example of samya, of perception. That, and what I want to remind everybody about is, is the way in which, you know, the body of form, it's about that unique body of form that is is shaped exactly like that and it's about those sensory organs 
that, you know, maybe are very sensitive, like you have really sensitive hearing. And so the, the sensations are very loud, but that's specific to you, specific to that body of form. Perception as well in that way is unique to that body of form based upon the makeup of the eyes and so on. But what the Buddha is getting, getting at here, it seems like, is that same idea that it's it's not that you're perceiving, even though I know I just threw out a bunch of first person pronouns. It's not you that is perceiving. Perception is perceiving. And now I want to remind everybody too, like I, the reason why I wanted to read that, that little, not your sutra to begin with is I really wanted to plant a, plant a seed in our minds. This idea of like, all right, these five aggregates are not mine. And so this sutra is picking up on that idea of saying this idea that these sensations, these sensations are not yours in that way there's sensation happening but this clinging to them as if they're yours that's the problem and so we're going through these in a way that we can appreciate them functioning all on their own just the just like how you breathe <laughs> all on it all, it goes all on its own and you don't have to do it it's already happening sensation and perception are just happening in that same sense but we could own them but this is suggesting we don't do that all right now the next one about samskara is particularly complicated so and by the way i'm going to rely again on bhikkhu bodhi's footnotes here so this is a situation where bhikkhu bodhi kind of admits that volitional formations are not exactly the best translation of samskara. <laughs> and it has to do with the fact that samskar, samskara, it does have this kind of constructing aspect to it. And so he suggests, Bhikkhu Bodhi suggests that we could read this as and why bhikkhus do you call them constructions volitional formations but let's also remember that this idea can be translated as habits habitual energy conditioning so let's try to work through this keeping all that in mind and why bhikkhus do you call them samskara why do you call them conditioning or constructions? They construct the conditioned bhikkhus. Therefore, they are called constructions or habits or volitional formations. And what is the conditioned that they construct? They construct conditioned form as form they construct conditioned sensations as sensation they construct conditioned perception as perception they construct conditioned constructions as constructions <laughs> so they construct con uh, volitional formations as volitional formations they construct conditioned consciousness as consciousness they construct the conditioned bhikkhus Therefore, they are called volitional formations or samskara or conditioning in that way. All right. So if you have this version and you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote there, I think it's like footnote 112, he talks about how this paragraph is using the root word samskar three different ways. <laughs> and the Buddha is like, you know, clearly masterfully constructing this idea. So none of this is coming across here. But let me kind of give you something that's important that is coming, that is here. So 
I, I've been meaning to mention this too. I've been almost, I've been meaning to mention this almost kind of every night that we've been talking about the aggregates. So the thing about it is, is that I do it. Most Dharma teachers do it. We talk about form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, you know, the five aggregates. And we talk about that and it can kind of sound like there are these five things, five different things in that way. And it's actually much more complicated than that. And what it is, is you kind of need to, to really appreciate the teaching of the five skandhas. What you kind of need to appreciate is that let's just take the, the ears. So just the ears, the, my ears, your ears, all ears are shaped a certain way. In other words, they are formed a certain way. So that's the rupa. That's the first aggregate. My ears, which are formed, rupa, a certain way, they sense a certain way. Like I was saying earlier, you know, you might have big, you know, big elephant ears. And so the form of your ears is very big. And so you can hear really well. And so the sensations of the ears is dependent upon the shape of the ears is what I'm getting at. So there's form and sensation and there's perception. There is auditory perception. There's visual perception. There's olfactory perception. So what I'm getting at is, is that each of the sensory organs is form that's in the business of sensing, that's in the business of perceiving, and the ears and the nose and the eyes and the tongue and the body and the brain are all conditioned over, they are all conditioned. So they all have their own samskara. And then this is where it gets a little weird at first. In the Buddhist tradition, each of the sensory organs are conscious. But this is where the word vijnana, vijnana being translated as consciousness, it sort of falls apart here. It's where the fifth aggregate, the fifth skandha, is better thought of as kind of awareness. And so we can talk about auditory awareness. The Buddhists would call it auditory consciousness. But in English and in, in Western psychology, consciousness is singular. And consciousness is synonymous with thinking. And it's important to know that in the Buddhist tradition, especially early Buddhism, each of the sensory organs is a little five skandha aggregation. And then, I, so I've got these five skandhas with these five skandhas, with these five skandhas, with these five skandhas, with these five skandhas that are all in the business based on their form of sensing a certain way perceiving, but their perception is going to be rooted and filtered through conditioning. And then that's going to determine their final kind of awareness, an auditory awareness, a visual awareness, olfactory awareness, gustatory awareness, tactile awareness. And then there's the brain. And the brain is sitting back there. And the brain is also a sensory organ that's of a particular form, particular shape with two hemispheres, right? It's a bicameral mind, two hemispheres. And the brain also is in the business of sensing. 
but the brain senses the awarenesses of the other five organs. So the brain doesn't hear, the brain senses what the ears are aware of. In other words, in early Buddhism, the brain functions as a kind of central processing unit that takes the impressions of all five external organs. And insofar as the brain is a sensory organ, it senses and perceives these impressions from the five external organs. But the brain is conditioned just like all the other sensory organs are conditioned. So it's going to be interpreting those impressions in a conditioned way. And then it, meaning the brain, will have this kind of consciousness of the stitched together image that has been kind of created virtually of the impressions provided by the external organs. So it's very complicated. It's not just body of form, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. It's that happening six different ways. And all of that is not yours in that sense. So that is sort of what was being spoken about in the conditioning aspect that what is the conditioning conditions this whole thing. That's what conditioning does in that sense. All right, everybody doing okay with that? I know that was a long digression, but it's just something important to establish. And why bhikkhus? One question. Yes, and then in that way, consciousness is utterly conditioned in that sense. Yeah, that was part of Maria's question there. But speaking of consciousness, and why bhikkhus, do you call it vijnana, consciousness? It, it cognizes bhikkhus, therefore it's called consciousness. And what does it cognize? It cognizes sour, it cognizes bitter, it cognizes pungent, it cognizes sweet, it cognizes sharp, it cognizes mild, it cognizes salty, it cognizes bland. It cognizes bhikkhus, therefore it's called consciousness. So this particular consciousness, the Buddha has chosen taste, various aspects of taste to illustrate consciousness. But that's where I would again suggest that the Buddha is probably speaking metaphorically, very similar to the way that in, even in English, we often use, well, we, we, we love to use the term sweet to refer to things other than food right? Like, oh, that was so sweet of you. They're a really sweet person. So in English, we already use like sweet, sour, I guess we use it a little bit to mean something other than food. I think the Buddha is sort of referring to that in terms of the function of consciousness. Consciousness in this sense is about likes, dislikes, that kind of a thing. So if you go back to perception, perception is about red, white, yellow, blue, you know, color. But how you feel about those colors, do you like these colors? Do you not like those colors? Would you like this color to be a little more richer? Or So I want you to notice that perception is in the business of determining differentiation consciousness is in the business of sort of throwing on on top of that all kinds of things like desirability value what have you so okay any questions about those five explanations of the aggregates you're doing okay with those hopefully those were maybe clarifying in some way 
Okay, so now we can get to the kind of the title of the sutra. So now that all of that has been stated, and I did intend, by the way, to really add that complexity of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the brain, all operating in a conditioned fashion and all of that. I wanted to kind of really heap all of this on top of you so that after the Buddha explains all of these things about the aggregates, he says, therefore bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple reflects thus, I'm being devoured. <laughs> I am now being devoured by form. In the past too, I was devoured by form in the very same way that I am now being devoured by form. If I were to seek delight in future form, then in the future too, I shall be devoured by form in the very same way that I am now being devoured by present form. Having reflected thus, one becomes indifferent towards past form. One does not seek delight in future form. And one is practicing for revulsion towards present form for its fading away and cessation. And then of course, one also reflects thus, I am now being devoured by sensations or feelings. In the past too, I was devoured by sensations in the very same way that I am now being devoured by sensations and so on for the rest of the aggregates. So, this sutta, this sutra is called this uh, Kahaj Jahiya. Is that what it is? The Kahaj Jahiya? Oh, Janiya. Kahaj Janiya Sutta. And I was looking, trying to figure out what this word Kaha, jan, Kahaj Janiya means. And it's translated by some people as itchy. Others, as, as Bhikkhu Bodhi does, as being devoured. But when I looked into the meaning of the word, kaha, so not kahaj, well, kahaj, the first part of this word, it means like a, like a blister, um, you know, just a skin condition, a, a rash. That's why it gets translated as itchy, because... A kahaj is a uh, like a rash in that way. And then kahaj jahia is this idea of sort of being consumed by the rash or being consumed by the itching. So it's kind of a tricky term. Like, do you try to capture the itchiness or do you try to capture the consumption? And so Bhikkhu Bodhi goes for this translation of I'm being devoured in that sense. But I, I feel like the vibe of it or the feeling should be this sort of like, like hives, you know, itchy hives in that way that are kind of taking over the whole body. And you're like, ah, I, I'm being consumed by these hives, but it's not hives. It's the body of form and sensations and perception, conditioning and consciousness that we're being devoured by in that sense. So let's look at it this way. So the Buddha says the, the instructed noble disciple therefore reflects this way. They think this way. I am now presently being consumed or devoured by form. And uh, once again, they are referring to the physical body of form in that sense. And then this idea of in the past too, I was devoured by form in the very same way that I am now presently being devoured by a form. And then if I were to seek delight in a future body of form, 
then in the future too, I shall be devoured by form in the very same way that I am now being devoured by form. So we have three kind of options, the body of form in the past, the body of form as it presently is, and then the future body of form. Now, in case you missed it, because it's been a minute since we started, the Buddha has basically now come back around to the opening of the sutra. So remember, the opening of the sutra was about these people that are talking about their past live experiences. And the Buddha is now saying this idea that and it's it's a really important idea that I'm I'm talking about a lot in Dharma doors. I feel like I mentioned this a lot. It's this problem, or it's not a problem, but it's like it's this complicated thing in Buddhism about how there is reincarnation, but there's nothing reincarnated. And that idea of reincarnation without something that is reincarnated can be a little bit of a like, huh? Like, what does that mean? Or how does that work? And I'm often talking about how the teaching is about this delusion of a sense of self that doesn't exist, but we think it does. And th again, this is where it, it all comes down to this idea. It's the idea of me when I was little. I talk about this one all the time. That idea of me when I was little, like me when I was a child, that's what the Buddha says doesn't exist. You, that this present body of form that is hearing this, these sensations that are hearing this, these perception, this perception that's perceiving this, this was not that. Pat it's patently obvious that this was not that. But every single time we think, when I was little, that's the delusion. That idea of me then and now. So regarding that idea of no self in that way, meaning no self that stretches across time, let's just put it that way to put it simple. The point though, is that I can and I do cling to and identify with that child body as me. It's not true, but I do it nonetheless. I still cling to it as if it's me. And so from a Buddhist point of view, a past life, you can cling to it as if it was your past life. And that's what the Brahmins and ascetics are doing at the beginning of the sutra. They're clinging to a past life as me versus there have, having been that that led to this. So it, 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 in, in the same way that the childhood body and childhood karma and childhood sensations and perception and conditioning and consciousness has led to this, but to think that I am that is a delusion. And then actually what we're talking about tonight, of course, is to think I am this is a delusion. Forget about the past. Forget about the future. We're talking about this very body you think is your body right here, right now. So, um, so Buddha was talking about how you, you can cling to that in that way. So, and that would be being devoured by form in the past. I was, I was devoured by form then, meaning when I was a kid, I thought that body was mine too. Then. <laughs> And I'm still under that delusion now where I think this is me in that way. And then, of course, 
insofar as I'm like, oh, I hope in the future I've got whatever, such and such a body, then I'm being devoured by form again. And I'm setting myself up to continue to be devoured by form in the future. All right. Everybody doing okay with all of that? Cool. All right. So, but, ah, this is, and this is what I wanted to talk about, or I wanted to talk about all of this, of course. So if, you know, if I were to seek delight in the future, I'd be devoured by form in the same way. And so having reflected thus, one becomes indifferent towards past form. One does not seek delight in future form. And one is currently practicing for revulsion towards present form, for its fading away and its cessation. Now, that last part, the idea of its fading away sensation, we did a whole night on that. We did a whole sutra about the arising and ceasing of the five skandhas. So I'm not going to deal with that. But I do want to deal with this idea of being indifferent and developing revulsion towards. This is where I want to jump in and I want to remind everybody that this is a sutta, a Pali sutta from the early Buddhist tradition. And as I'm always mentioning in Dharma doors, the early Buddhist tradition was much more negative towards the world, definitely the body. It was very negative towards it. And the goal of early Buddhism was to become repulsed and totally revolted by your own body. I want you to know, though, that the Mahayana Buddhist tradition and why I practice Mahayana Buddhism, why I primarily teach Mahayana Buddhism, they explicitly deny the practice of developing revulsion towards the body. They deny it. They say that that is not a helpful practice. So I just want you to know that it's not all forms of Buddhism that encourage such feelings in that way towards the body. But that being said, insofar as we are dealing with an early Buddhist sutta, let's, let's do it. Like, let's take it seriously in that way. And what I want you to think about is, is I want you to go back to the opening sutta, the sutta not yours. And it's this idea of the body, not me, not mine. The sensations that are being happened, that are happening right now, not me, not mine. What's being perceived, not me, not mine. The habits that are enacting right now, not me, not mine. And then ultimately this very consciousness, not me, not mine. And then to move into that state where one is not clinging or identifying with the five aggregates, that's the goal. I mean, I mean, not the goal, but that's what we're talking about. And although there are a variety of techniques to do that. It is a technique to develop revulsion or indifference towards your own body. But let's think about this kind of rationally. Like, let's not, you know, just kind of knee jerk, um, like that that doesn't sound right. Let's look at it real quick. We want to think about or we want to notice the opposite of being repulsed or uh, re uh, having revulsion towards the body. Well, the opposite of that in, in extreme cases, of course, is like what we call narcissism and this kind of obsession with the body of form. And there's a way in which, especially if you're watching this, so you're probably Buddhist, so you already probably have Buddhist leanings in that way, you already probably know the problem with obsession, obsession with physical appearance. 
in that way. Like the stress, the anxiety, the dukkha that truly arises from worrying about blemishes, that worrying about, you know, hair color or hair loss, all of these physical features, and then obsessing about them, not being indifferent towards them, but actually being very invested in them. We want to notice that behavior. Just look at it. We don't need to judge it. We don't need to critique it, but just look at that. <laughs> Again, that kind of obsession with how I, how I look. And then think about this indifference. It's like, I don't know about you, but that just feels very um, free to me. That feels very loose to me. That feels very good to me. That idea of not obsessing in that sense. Now, again, I wouldn't go so far as to advocate revulsion towards the body, like to where you look at it and it makes you sick. I wouldn't go that far, but I would sort of think about any, um, well, on this note, and I want to get a little further in the sutta, so I'll just say this regarding this particular point about revulsion towards the body. An interesting thing to think about, and perhaps to notice, there's a way in which we can notice our faults, our blemishes, our shortcomings, and all of that. But there's also a way in which we might, you know, think highly of ourselves. And, you know, think, oh, no, tonight, though, tonight I'm looking good. And it's sort of always about paying attention to both sides of this. The, what we might call the positive side and the negative side. And for me, you know, Buddhism is always that middle path. And so I'm always sort of looking for that middle zone between those. So. I personally do try to notice times when I'm, you know, feeling good about the way I look or feel, and then noticing feeling bad or feeling that, that I look bad. And it's about sort of paying attention to both of those. And again, not judging it or critiquing it, but just noticing that it swings both ways. And a good practice. You might already do this practice, but a good practice, it's really easy to notice when something feels bad or wrong, like with a body part or something like that. It's very easy to notice it. It like screams, pay attention to me, I'm here. But we actually maybe often don't notice when we're feeling good. And like actually stop and be like, you know what? <laughs> it's feeling pretty good today. It's actually a valuable part of the practice to observe that. We don't need to get all excited about it. We don't have to get elated about it, but notice it either way. Notice if something's feeling painful and bad. Notice if something's feeling really good. It's a big part of Buddhism to just be observational about things without reacting and judging. So a good place to practice is towards our own body in that way. So I just wanted to offset the revulsion towards the body a little bit. So any questions or ideas so far? All right, let's keep going because I would love to move through this sutra. Okay, so after we have um, let's see. All right. So we go through all five aggregates and I'm not going to repeat all of the, the ones here, but the last one, um, I am now presently being devoured by consciousness. 
In the past, too, I was devoured by consciousness in the very same way that I am now being devoured by present consciousness. If I were to seek delight in future consciousness, then in the future, too, I shall be devoured by consciousness in the very same way that I am now being devoured by present consciousness. Having reflected thus, one becomes indifferent towards past consciousness, one does not seek delight in future consciousness, and one is practicing for revulsion towards present consciousness, for its fading away and cessation. Now, what do you think, bhikkhus? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. And is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, no venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, venerable sir. And what do you think, bhikkhus? Are sensations permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. And is what is impermanent? Is it suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. And is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded as self, as mine? No, venerable sir. And same too with perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So this is an important one. This is an, there are whole other sutras that we didn't do, that I'm not going to do, in this section. And it's about this idea of it's the same line of questions. Are the skandhas permanent or impermanent? They're impermanent. And is are impermanent things suffering or joy? <laughs> suffering. And is that which is impermanent and suffering, is that appropriate to call me and mine and self? No. So this is where we have a tie-in with the opening sutra. With this idea of not, it's not me. Now, what I would like you to know, and I don't, I don't want to get too off on this because I won't be able to finish the sutta, and I think we should probably finish this sutta tonight. So, what happens is, is that in the early Buddhist tradition, like we're reading here, we get this idea that that which is impermanent that which is suffering, that's not me. And in the early Buddhist tradition, they just sort of leave it at that. And it, and I mentioned it at the beginning of class tonight. There's this kind of looming question then, which is what doesn't, isn't identifying with the aggregates? What doesn't identify as the impermanent suffering skandhas. What is that? I don't want to miss my opportunity, so I will answer that question, but I, I can only answer it in a very Zen way. The Zen Buddhist answer to the question, what is it that abandons the aggregates? The Zen question, the Zen answer to that is, what's asking? Or who's asking? Well, it's that. <laughs> Subtle, mysterious, but that's the best, in my experience, that's actually the best way to say it. Because it is that. It is that which is asking the question. Now, is that which is asking the question attached to the body of form and sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. 
But either way, that which abandons the aggregates is that which is asking that question. So don't worry, I'm going to say a little bit more about that idea, but I just wanted to mention that right here, that there's that. <laughs> Let's keep going though, because I do think the sutra will explain a few a little bit more. So after not calling the impermanent suffering that which is subject to change, it is not fit to be regarded as mine, as me, or as myself. Therefore, bhikkhus. Any kind of form whatsoever, whether past form, future form, or present form, internal form, external form, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, All form should be seen as it really is, with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of sensation whatsoever, past, future, present, internal, external, gross or subtle, inferior, superior, far or near, all sensations should be seen as they really are with correct wisdom. They should be seen thus. These sensations are not mine. These sensations are I am not. These are not myself. And the same with perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So there we have it again. Not me, not mine. And that's regarding form, sensation, perception, condition, and consciousness in the past, even past lives, in the future, even future lives, and then even in the very present. And so to do that, to not call the aggregates mine or me or self, to not do that, this is called, bhikkhus, a noble disciple who dismantles and doesn't build back up, who abandons and does not cling again, who scatters and does not amass, who extinguishes and does not rekindle. And what is it that one dismantles and doesn't build back up? One dismantles form and doesn't build it back up. One dismantles sensations and doesn't build them back up. One dismantles perception, conditioning, and consciousness and doesn't build them back up. And what is it that one abandons and, do and no longer clings to? One abandons form and does not cling to it. One abandons sensation, perceptions, conditioning, and consciousness and does not cling to them. And what is it that one scatters and does not amass? One scatters form and does not amass it. One scatters sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness and doesn't reamass them. And what is it that one extinguishes and doesn't rekindle? One extinguishes form and doesn't rekindle it. One extinguishes sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness and doesn't rekindle them. Seeing thus, bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion towards form, revulsion towards sensation, Revulsion towards perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Experiencing revulsion, one becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. 
When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. One understands. Destroyed is birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more for this state of being. Now, I want us to pay really close attention to this next part. So a moment ago, the Buddha was talking about abandoning this attachment to the skandhas. And he said that this is called a noble disciple who dismantles and doesn't build back up, right? Who abandons but doesn't cling, who scatters but doesn't amass, and who extinguishes but doesn't rekindle. So the language is about one who dismantles and does not build back up. But then after going through all of that, and then after establishing what basically is our hot ship, when they use the language of what, has, what had to be done has been done, there's no more for this state of being, that's the language of our hot ship. So I want you to notice what happens after our hot ship. Our hot ship, that level, this is called bhikkhus, a noble disciple who neither builds up nor dismantles, but who abides having dismantled, who neither abandons nor clings, but who abides having abandoned, who neither scatters nor amasses, but who abides having scattered, who neither extinguishes nor kindles, but who abides having extinguished. And what is it, Bhikkhus, that one neither builds up nor dismantles, but abides having dismantled? One neither builds up nor dismantles form, but abides having dismantled it. And one neither builds up nor dismantles sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness, but abides having dismantled them. And what is it that one neither abandons nor clings to? The five aggregates. And what is it that one neither scatters nor amasses, but abides having scattered? the five aggregates? And what is it that one neither extinguishes nor kindles, but abides having extinguished? The five aggregates. When bhikkhus, a bhikkhu is thus liberated in mind, the devas together with Indra, Brahma, and Pajapati pay homage to that person from afar. And then something the gods might say about this person is homage to this thoroughbred of humans, homage to this highest of humans. We ourselves do not directly know dependent upon what you meditate. Svaha. Okay, so I personally find that last part where it moves from dismantling and, and not rebuilding to then neither dismantling nor rebuilding. I actually, from all of the Mahayana sutras we did before this, that's kind of an interesting aspect there. Where building up to this practice, or I should say building up to this realization, there is the abandoning, meaning in a way there is still that agent, sense of self, that subject who is doing something, which is abandoning in that sense, not you know dismantling, but not building back up. But then once we go all the way to the actual realization of no self in an arhat way, there is neither dismantling nor rebuilding. And that's from the perspective of that mind 
that is no longer attached to and identifying with the body of form and sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. They're no longer identifying with it. So there's no dis dismantle what? Right? Scatter what? From that enlightened mind's perspective. So. Okay. I do have just a couple more comments or whatever, but. I'd love to hear from you if there is anything, comments, questions, answers, ideas, especially about that last uh, longer part I read or the whole theme tonight. Yeah, Maria. Excuse me. Um, the, um, this seems like um, one of these tricky little sutra moves where you know, we started with this sort of um, straightforward language, and then now we're at neither nor, and that's the language of emptiness. So um, mm -hmm. I see, I see what the Buddha did there. So nice, <clears throat> very nice. All right, so. Let's, I want to spend the next or the last few minutes trying to sort of do two things. One is I want to return to Maria's question at the beginning about consciousness and the relationship to what we've been talking about in, in terms of abandoning consciousness. And then again, that raises the question, well, then what, what's left after that then, right? So I want to talk about that idea of consciousness. And ultimately, I want to get closer to a better answer to that question of what abandons attachment to the five skandhas. So I'll try to put it simply and clearly first with the hope that I that's just successful and then that's that'll be it so it's it's sort of you can think about it or I think about it two different ways one way so it's so the two different ways, sorry, I'm just kind of getting a few thoughts together here. So we want to think about mind versus consciousness. And I've already started talking about that when I threw at you the fact that there's six consciousnesses. One second, buddy. Right, that's my little friend. So in other words, the first thing that we want to keep in mind is that consciousness is already, it, meaning vijnana, vijnana, consciousness is already very fractured. It's fractured into these six experiential qualities, sounds, smells, but then it's fractured because vijnana, what we are calling consciousness, vijnana, consciousness, is always only dualistic. Consciousness needs to be conscious of something. Consciousness implies subject-object, first of all. We, we kind of need to see how that is like, oh, right. Like if there is consciousness, then there's consciousness of something. So there's two, two sides to it. This is what we're calling subject object in that way. So the point is, is that consciousness as such is fractured and dualistic. Mind inherently is not. 
a moment ago when I dropped on you the Zen, my Zen answer, which is that this, this is whatever is hearing this, this is the mind that is the liberated mind that is not, that can be not attached to the skandhas. It's this mind. But the thing about mind is if mind is thinking in terms of subject object, then that's consciousness. It's mind, but it's confused because it's participating in this subject object situation. So that's one thing to consider regarding abandoning consciousness. It's not that you are abandoning thought exactly, you're abandoning a certain way of thinking, which we could, in simplicity, for simplicity's sake, we just could call the subject object relationship. But there's something going on with that. And these are the two things that I, I keep wanting to talk about. The mind, not consciousness that's all discriminatory, but mind is also in the habit it, it's so clingy. It appropriates. This is the idea that the mind has a problem that it likes to appropriate. And by appropriate, it likes to go around saying like, this is my arm. This is my other arm. That's your arm. That's your head. This is my head. So this sort of game of, of appropriating, that is the problem, the appropriating. That's what the Buddha, that's what we've been talking about all night, is the mind's habit of appropriating the skandhas, oh, like owning them and being like, this is me, this is mine. So there's this appropriation that is the problem. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's for a reason. Here's the thing about it. When the Buddha tells us about not abandoning or not clinging to the skandhas, abandoning the skandhas, the question, what is that that doesn't cling? It's that appropriating mind again that just can't stand not appropriating. And so it wants to know what to appropriate. So do you see how subtle this is in terms of that which is not the skandhas? That conditioned delusional mind wants to cling on to it. It wants to know what it is so that it can cling on to it in that way. But that's the problem. The problem is the appropriating and clinging. So notice that it keeps happening. Even when we get to this subtle realm of mind and then it's like yeah my mind no stop doing that <laughs> stop appropriating mine in that way so just i just I kind of probably should leave it at that idea in that way so unless there's questions comments answers or ideas but uh, let's leave it at that we're going to keep going with the skandhas for a little bit more uh next week but anything come up from all of that yeah, no. Uh, th thank you for that. That that was really clear. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm 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 sort of curious how how you would uh, answer the question of if consciousness is aware of itself, is that still dualistic? Consciousness being aware of itself is a language game. It, that's taking words and making a sentence. If that makes sense. It, I, I understand the question. Yeah. But it's about looking at the question and noticing it it's um it, 
it's sort of like, I guess from a basic point of view, the, the simple answer is yes, kind of, sort of. <laughs> but because I want to keep pointing at the mind, not consciousness, mm -hmm. that's where I said the thing about you just put words together that mean, you know, these words have meaning, consciousness, awareness, self, is consciousness aware of itself? We can put these words together into a sentence, but it's all just, I no, what I'm getting at is it's all just a trap. It's a, a language trap. This is one of the, like, I'm, the, the Buddha in a way would probably say that the answer to that question doesn't get us anywhere. Do, 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 do you don't think it's a useful thing to try to do to let, let awareness be aware of itself? Forget well, the question, forget the question well, whether that's dualistic. Do you think uh, that's a useful thing? I, I figured it out. I figured out the, the problem. Okay. So the, the Buddha, or in sutras, the Buddha often asks this very interesting question. Can the tongue taste itself? Mm. Not really. So when you ask the question, we need to remember that consciousness is sixfold. There are six consciousnesses. And yes, one of these consciousnesses can be aware of another consciousness, but a particular consciousness cannot be aware of itself in the sense that the tongue cannot taste itself. The eyes cannot see themselves. I, I know they can in a mirror, but I mean without the help of a mirror. So do you see my point, Noam? Yeah, I'm going to think about it some more. Thank you. Okay. Right. I, I'm in like a Zen teacher mode where it's sort of more like, no, there is no consciousness. So, yeah, Maria. Oh. No. There it is. Yeah. Um, so my earlier thought was, oh, this explains why I'm conflating these I, the idea of consciousness and sometimes I just slip into thinking that there's a self with before I catch myself and then there's awareness and then there's mind so all that seems to me to be there's mind right and it's trying to appropriate and it's trying to say oh well consciousness is is me is the self or the one who's looking is the self or awareness is the self or whatever, but it's ultimately mind's delusion, delusional perspective, talking about all these other things that are, um, may or may not be, um, I don't know, anyways. Um, it's just mind's perspective trying to appropriate all these other things um, mm -hmm. that are actually aggregates. Um, awareness might be questionable. That's why I hesitated. So awareness and mind might kind of be the same thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I can leave it at that. I, I, I just realized that I should remind everybody of something. I should have like mentioned this a long time ago or earlier. Let's remember our vocabulary. Within the world of Buddhism, there is something known as citta, C-I-T-T-A, mind. I prefer mind state because I'm a kind of a Buddhist that way. So I think in terms of states of mind, not a stagnant noun, the mind. I think of mind states, which is citta, but citta is not vinyana. That's why I'm making this point tonight about there's mind and states of mind that arise or can arise dependent upon consciousness, what we might call awareness. But that mind state is arising based on sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So the, the awareness, vinyana, is just one part of this construction of mind. 
And then it's a question of um, chitta klesha, mind defilements. And the self is like a giant stain on mind. <laughs> so on that note of the stain of the self, let's call it a night. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Fun night. Two sutras, sort of three, kind of. That's cool. All right, everybody. On that Thank note, you, my Thank great you. pleasure. Thank you. Always. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Always happy to be here. I'll see you next week. <laughs>